I love when you have your favorite version open as well. Good to see you, buddy. <clears throat> so we're going to post this. I don't try to live stream. That doesn't seem to work real well. But we'll post this up for those that want to see that couldn't be here this morning. So that will be available hopefully this afternoon. Well, we're going to start off in James 3. James 3.13 is at the top of your sheet. And uh, James has been talking to teachers in the church. And I, I do think this has special application to teachers in the church. But this, man, we all need this especially in these times of conflict. Um, this will help us with our families, with our church family, with the country. All right, who is wise and understanding among you? And don't we need more of that? By his good conduct, let him show his works. And I think the point here in the context of the tongue is don't just talk about how wise you are. We, ought to be, we will be able to see it. We'll be able to see it in your life. So <clears throat> by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness or the gentleness or the humility of wisdom. Uh, let me see. Is this thing recording? I think it is. Yeah. Um, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly unspiritual, demonic. Right, so that's a strong warning. So there is something that appears to the world to be, oh, that's wise. That makes some sense to us. But when you look at what comes from it, it's all kinds of sin and division and strife and, 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 the, and God says, that's not the wisdom that's from above. There is a seeming wisdom to the world, but we gotta be on the lookout and say, that's not the wisdom from above. Um, and so we're looking for the wisdom that is from above. Uh, so this is not the wisdom that comes from, from above. Well, what is the wisdom? Well, uh, verse 16. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist. By the way, we're going to find out the wrong kind of jealousy. Um, God's going to talk about he's jealous for his own glory. That's a good jealousy. But this is called talking about personal selfish jealousy. You know, I want to get my way. I want to win my argument. I'm seeing... So much, and it's so easy to slip into this. I can want to win my argument more than try to see the other person walk in godliness. And, um, and we can get very angry. And we need to remember an earlier verse in James. James 1 says, the wrath of man, what does it say about the anger of man? Does not work the righteousness of God. Now, you might get short-term results. You get angry at your kids. You can get them to straighten up for a little bit while you're around. But I hope you don't just want your kids to straighten up when you're around. I hope you want the righteousness of God, that whether you're there or not, they want what God wants. And um, that is not going to come in by anger. And so we often, I think sometimes we try to call it uh, righteous anger. But, and the Bible says to be very, very wary of our jealousy and our anger and things like that. So where jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there will be disorder in every vile practice. And by the way, vile practice as defined by what? Scripture and God, right? Not, not as defined by our world. Our, um, our world would say, yeah, we don't like what we're seeing from you churches. Um, but we need to say, no, vile practice as determined by God's word. And um, all right, so here's what we're looking for. James 3.17. But the wisdom from above, that's the heavenly, godly wisdom, is first pure. And then I, I put some comments. Let me just read it. First pure, then peaceable. So go to the bold things here down my column. Gentle, open to reason, or easy to be entreated, or willing to yield. Full of mercy and good fruits. Both things, some people who call themselves big on mercy seem to not care at all about good fruits, according to the Bible. The wisdom that is from above is concerned about both mercy and good fruits. Um, impartial, that means not favoring any side except what God has said, um, and sincere or without hypocrisy. And I think that means let's make sure we're not acting one way in our church group and then in another way with our social media group. You know, and, and we get all angry there, and or another way with our family, or another way with our friends at work, or that's not sincere. That's that's 
that's with hypocrisy. That's acting one way so that your church people will think highly of you. And then it's acting another way so your work friends or your social media friends or whatever will think highly of you. That is, that is not the wisdom that is from, the, from above. The wisdom that is from above, if we were to see you at any point in your life, we should go, hey, that's the same person I know. Um, all right, I want to go back through some of those other first words. The wisdom that is from above is first pure. And I think the er order is so important. I mean, he highlights it by saying first pure. I think if we had to pick, and we often do these days, over pure and peaceable, you pick pure. For instance, if somebody in the world comes up, and they will, and says, wait a minute, if you're going to really hold to that whole Jesus is the only way to go to heaven, then you and I can't be friends. Well, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so, I, first pure, then peaceable. Uh, so, uh, so even by, beside the verse uh, on, on peaceable, the word peaceable, I put Romans 12, 18. Look at Romans 12, 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. But, but if somebody comes up, and there's lots of folks who will say this. If you're going to stick to the Bible really means it, that sex is only between a husband and a wife, a man and a woman in the context of marriage, you and I can't be friends anymore. And you say, well, I'm really sorry about that. I'm sad about that. I'll be praying because I want to be your friend, but, but I can't lose the purity of God's word in order to keep peace. That, so first pure, then peaceable. Now, what is pure? Well, it's pure as God defines it. And I want to be careful because I'm going to talk a lot about balance today because I think this, this text has some wonderful balancing truths. But I also want to be careful about the word balance because I think a lot of times when people use it, they mean a little godliness and a little worldliness to keep the world happy so they'll listen to us. That's how, it, that's how it's presented. But if, if we really say that full on what the Bible says, they're not going to listen to us. Well, okay. Then you move on, you know, and, and you see who God is working in their heart. But... Uh, we've got to be first pure, then peaceable. Um, in the context of James 3, he's just talked about you shouldn't have from the same mouth cursing and blessing. You shouldn't have, you can't have a nature, ooh, that's good sweet water, and ooh, that's salt water. Um, now, you can have brackish water, but brackish water nobody wants. I mean, that, that doesn't have the benefits of the nice salty water, and it doesn't have the sweetness of the fresh water. Um, and so that's what it's talking about here. It shouldn't be. So when people say balance, you need to be very careful. Make sure we're meaning scriptural balance and not a little scripture and a little worldliness so the world will listen to us. I'm not for that kind of balance at all. First pure, then peaceable. That's the kind of balance I'm talking about. Um, uh, a thought on, on purity. We've got to over and over keep coming back to the scriptures to let that define what pure is. And we need each other to help each other. Because we can do two things. We can start watering down purity. Um, we were having a great conversation in our family last night. You missed it. You had gone on bed, but um, uh, what about eleven o'clock last night? We were talking about um, how to be pure in what God says about sex, and still reach out to our lost friends because we don't, we don't, they don't, they're not going to get it at all. But we can't compromise what God's word says. So, so we were talking about how do we do that? How do we try to be first pure? And it was helpful to talk together and say, but we've got to remember this, this principle of scripture. And then, but don't forget this. And, uh, and, and so we, we need each other to say, um, make sure you're not watering down purity with worldliness. But there's another problem. Sometimes we can be so keen on what we, we want to be purity that we start being and I'm going to put this in quotes because this is impossible. More pure than God. Give me a, a group in the Bible that Jesus constantly butted heads with that put up extra fences. 
Pharisees all the time. Um, I, I think it started in a good, good desire. We want people to stay pure. So they added lots of laws. By the way, and they kept loopholes so they could still do their thing. And that, see, that's that's the that's the real problem with trying to be more pure than God. Sometimes we, I want people to be pure. I'm going to add this, and I'm going to add this, and I'm watch out. And see, that's why we need each other. Also, I think that's a danger. Uh, so first, pure, keeping coming back to what the Bible says pure is. Um, oh, oh, there's another thing. In uh, did somebody have a comment? Uh, not for, not as pure as we should be, right? But that's our goal. That our goal. Our goal is, Lord, help me to be first pure, then peaceable. And um, and we do need constant correction from God's word and constant reminders from each other, lovingly, because first pure, then peaceable. And and we want to be gentle with each other. By the way, in that the next word, gentle. Um, um, so I put under pure a couple things that we need to be careful about. We need to be careful that when it comes to matters of convictions, like Romans 14, sometimes I've seen people be stronger on those matters where believers have some room for disagreement than where scripture is clear. And I've thought a lot about this. Here's why I think that is. Um, let me just give you an example. I believe the Bible says mostly about alcohol, be very, very careful. I think it also says that some believers can enjoy some alcohol. Now, thinking through all that, looking through all that, we have to, you have to work hard. You have to look up a lot of verses and you have to, you know, should I have anything to do with this? See, like I, I think as I've looked at the scripture and as I've looked at people in my life that struggle, I've, I've determined I don't need to have anything to do with alcohol. Um, and I got there after a lot of, I mean, hours and hours and hours of study. And so because we have to do extra study on some of those areas, I think we're extra invested sometimes. I'll give you another one, end times. You've got to come up with some kind of view on what you think the end is going to look like. But it's not super clear. There are really godly people that think it's going to be a literal thousand year, you know, a seven, literal seven year tribulation, then a literal thousand years. And, um, and then Jesus, so his return is in a couple different parts. And then, he'll, and then there are others that say, no, nah, I I, it, like it looks like one thing to me. And, and so godly Christians really, and, and so you, you look at the scriptures and you kind of come up with something. And I've seen Christians who will completely split fellowship. Well, you're not a believer. If you don't see the end times like I do, I, I can't have anything to do with you. And, and they're, sometimes they're more angry about that than things like what the Bible says about sexuality staying between a husband and wife in marriage, you know, which the Bible is super clear on. Because they've, they've invested so much time in the other. So anyway, we need to be very careful on that in the matter of purity. So... Um, Convictions are super important. We also need to make sure we're not trying to make everybody hold to our convictions. And is this really an area of conviction or is this an area where scripture has spoken to? So again, we need who? We need each other getting together around scripture and saying, but don't forget this, brother. Don't forget this verse, sister. And, and uh, so we need each other in this. First pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason. I think those are good just checks If you think you're just being strong on purity, but you're not being gentle, it's something else. It's, it's not the wisdom that's from above. Um, the Bible says in Thessalonians, it talks about different categories. But I have it somewhere on here that some are idle and need to be rebuked. Some are feeble-minded and we need to be encouraging to them. Um, and then it gives one other category. And then it says, but be patient with, with who? With all. You know why? The Lord was patient with us. And we need to be patient with one another. So gentle, open to reason. Boy, that's a good one. I love the King James there. The King James in, in that one is easy to be entreated. In other words, can somebody easily come up to you and say, 
but brother or sister, have you considered this side of the story? Or have you considered this verse? Or this set of, or this biblical principle? Or, um, and, and if, if we just, no, I'm not going to listen to that, you know, that, and, uh, and by the way, if nobody ever comes up and tries to do that, that probably means we're not easy to be entreated. Um, it is, right, and I, I think this definitely has special application to leaders, but, but for all of us, Uncle Al, it looks like you've got a comment. Yep, yep, yep. We have the same. Yes, yep. Exactly what you're saying. Yep, and so, yeah, we got to make sure we're easy to be entreated. Can people come to you? By the way, I, I, I always used to think of this until this study, this just this recent, this week. I'd always thought of this as being people who are quick to anger. And that's certainly true. If you're quick to anger, people are not going to entreat you. You're not easy to be entreated, you're not gentle. But I think there's another thing that I'm seeing more and more, and that is people that use, they say, that hurts me so much you can't talk to me about it. I've seen entire churches' discussion shut down, and they say, we can't talk about that. And I've seen entire colleges, which are supposed to help our young people learn to think and critical thinking. How do you evaluate contrary evidence and how you... In most campuses in America, you can't even discuss abortion anymore because it is considered too controversial. Um, I, too traumatizing. I, it, the, uh, this came up just this, um, I did my first tweet. I've been on Twitter for a, a little bit. Um, but I tweeted for the first time. I went to buy the movie, uh, the DVD Unplanned, which is the Abby Johnson story about Planned Parenthood. She used to be a leader in Planned Parenthood, and then uh, she realized this is murder, and she turned away from it. So the, the movie about it is, uh, is considered, I forgot it was rated R. Apparently it's considered too traumatizing by the movie people to consider uh, abortion. Um, it's not even very graphic, but... Um, but, but anyway, they, they uh, so anyway, it was rated R. So I was trying to do self-checkout at Walmart just this uh, Friday, I think. And it stopped me. I was confused. And the, uh, the employee had to come over and say, oh, it's because it's rated R. I have to certify that you're over 17. And it struck me it with just great sorrow as I was on the way, way out to the car. In most places in America, a young lady under 17 can go in without any author without any authorization from parents or anybody and she can get an abortion in other words it was harder for me to get a movie helping somebody think about abortion than it would be for a young lady in many places in the United States to get an abortion y'all that is wicked Here's what that is. That saying, they're not easy to be entreated. They're, they're, they're so fragile. They're so fragile. I can't consider that. that. That offends me. That triggers me. That's hurtful for me. So that's something we need to think. Are, are we using emotion, emotions to shut something down and to not be entreated with the other side and with scripture? And so we need to examine ourselves there. I think that's something that's hugely on the rise. And then uh, my sister Carissa said another one is some very nice people they'll list well they'll look like they're listening to the other side but the whole time they're sitting in, the, in their head going I I've already made it in my mind I'm not really listening. But they'll smile and nod thank you for sharing. Didn't listen you know and that's not easy to be entreated so ask yourself am Am I easy to be entreated? I, I love the King James there. So open to reason or easy to be entreated or willing to yield. By the way, willing to yield if you are shown scripture. Yeah, go ahead. Um, another one is the amount of your education can stop you from being easy. Good point. Um, you, think, mm. you just think you're smarter than everybody. Yes, and I don't know if, the, if they heard that on the... On the on the recording, so I want to put that. Jenny was just sharing, if you're very educated in some area, you may 
that may stop you from e being easy to, easy to be entreated because you say, oh, I, I'm the expert in this area and I don't need to listen to you. Good, great point, great point. Um, so now we're going to look at this illustrated in the life of Phinehas, one of my favorite Bible characters. So um, first pure is illustrated beautifully in Numbers 25. Let's look at Numbers 25 there in your study sheet. Well, Israel lived in Shittim, and by the way, I put some neat notes up there that I don't have time to go into, but I would encourage you to read them. There's some great stuff. While Israel lived in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. We find out elsewhere in Scripture, this was a plot. Remember Balaam? Balaam was the guy whose donkey ended up talking to him. Oh, yeah. He was a prophet, and the king of Moab named Balak... I was used to get them mixed up, and Dad said, remember it like this. Balak, with a K, was the king, the bad king. Balaam was the bad prophet. Well, they, they went to Balaam, and they said, hey, we know sometimes God works through you. We want to pay you to curse God's people. And he said, that sounds good. Um, first, first, let me go ask God <laughs> And this is a bad example of balance. This is, this is the wrong, this is impurity. This is trying a little God and a little worldliness. I want the world's money, but I'll, I'll go ask God's permission first. No, you don't mix like that. Uh, so anyway, he did, and God said, no, you can't curse my people, but, um, but if you'll say exactly what I tell you, you can go. So he's, oh, okay. And so he goes, and, and, uh, and so God, and Bala ends up getting real mad. Rather than curse them, he blesses them multiple times. God forces him to say what God wants him to say. As a matter of fact, we have the, the beautiful prophecy about the star that the wise men looked at years later came from Balaam. The only prophecy about the star connected to the king that is to come comes from, comes from Balaam. So uh, that's an, a neat little detail. So um, after all that, the king, King Balak, said, oh, I'm, I'm so mad. And Balaam was upset, too. He really wanted that money. The Bible makes clear in Jude that he loved money. So he said, I'll tell you what you do. God wouldn't let me do a, a frontal assault on his people, and he won't let you either. But if we can tempt them to sin, God will judge his own people. Send in your pretty girls and your handsome boys and get them mixing your idol-worshiping ways and get some of that impurity going in there, and God himself will come against them. And that's exactly what they did. And so while Israel was there, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their God. See, that's what it is, by the way. It's never in Scripture. Sometimes people have tried to say, oh, God is against, quote-unquote, interracial marriage or interethnic marriage. No, no, no. It's not a race thing. It's a faith thing. These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. That's what always happens. If you try to mix a little true God worship with a little worldly worship, it ends up being a mess that God won't have anything to do with. Um, so Israel yoked himself to Baal, that's a false god of pure, and the angle, anger of Yahweh, the Lord, was kindled against Israel. And Yahweh said to Moses, take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before Yahweh, that the fierce anger of Yahweh may turn away from Israel. Now you go, whoa! Remember, what form of government was Israel at this point? Theocracy. What God said, God was the king. What God said, he was judge, jury, and then told them to be the executioners. God said, I have judged. This needs to be stopped right now. You need to take the leaders and you need to kill them and you need to display their bodies out in the sun. Not bury them. You need to display their bodies as a warning to the people. This is how seriously God takes sin and sexual sin and false worship, which always all goes in together. Um, verse 5, and, uh, and I want to be clear. They were absolutely right to obey God here. In the New Testament church, I, I want to be just as clear, we are not to execute those who are unrepentant. We are to excommunicate them, right? So 1 Corinthians 5 says, here's what you do with a book. Uh, somebody who calls himself a believer but refuses to repent. You cut them off of the fellowship of the church. You excommunicate them. 
So I, I want to be clear on how this applies to the New Testament. We don't execute people, but we should excommunicate them. We should take a clear stand um, where God says take a clear stand. But our way of taking a clear stand does look different. So, but this was right for them. Moses said to the judges of Israel, each of you kill those of his men. So you are supposed to take care of your part of the world there and hold your people accountable who have yoked themselves to Baal of Peor. And behold, one of the people of Israel, we find out he was one of the leader's sons. One of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman and she was one of the leader's daughters to his family. So while they're talking about this, one of them boldly takes one of the Midianite girls into the tent. It's like, what are you going to do about it? I'm going to go ahead and do it right here. Who's going to stop me? I mean, it's that kind of bold, in-your-face sin. When God had just said, execute the ones who are leading in this. Um, so he brought a Midianite woman to his family in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel while they were weeping in the entrance of the tent of meeting. So while they're having this big come-to-God meeting of repentance, this young man takes this young woman and they're going to go consummate their relationship in, uh, in the tent. When Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose, so he's one of the leaders, he's one of the spiritual leaders, they were charged with, with carrying this out. He rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hand, went after the man of Israel into the chamber and pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly, which looks like they were in the middle of the act. Thus the plague on the people of Israel was stopped. By the way, you say, whoa, that wasn't gentle. Who was it gentle for? The whole nation. Thousands of people. Now, by the way, thousands had already died. This was a big deal. And so this was merciful. This stopped, this, God says, this, God saw that and stopped the plague that was killing the people off. Thus the plague on the people of Israel stopped. Nevertheless, those who died by the plague were 24,000. Verse 10, and Yahweh said to Moses, Phinehas, in case we're wondering, is this okay with God? More than okay with God. Phinehas, God says, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the people of Israel in that he was jealous with whose jealousy? My jealousy. No selfish jealousy. By the way, that young man and woman, self, young woman, they had selfish jealousy. We want our way. We're going to do our way in the front of everybody. We don't care. And, and, uh, but God says he was jealous with my jealousy among them so that I did not consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. Now look at this interesting things brought together. Verse 12. Therefore say, behold, I give to him my covenant of what? Peace. Now wait a minute. In this whole James 3 thing, first pure, then peaceable. What? Peaceable. And then at the end of it, it talks about a harvest of righteousness sown in peace by those who make peace. What's all this talk of peace in the standing for purity in this here it is. It's right here. He stood for peace and ultimate, or he stood for purity, and ultimately that brought what? Peace. And um, God said, I give him my covenant of peace. I'm in verse 13, and it shall be to him and to his descendants after him the covenant of a perpetual priesthood, because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. So, first pure. Now, what about then peaceable? Well, look at Joshua 22. I'm on the middle of page two. Now, uh, I've gotta, I got to be quick here. In Joshua 22, we're reminded of a huge previous misunderstanding. Here's what had happened. When God brought the people of Israel over into the land, remember, for 40 years they had to wander because they didn't go in the first time. And then, now the next generation went in. Well, just before they were going to cross over the river and start occupying the west side of the Jordan... A few of the tribes said, hey, we really like this area on the eastern side. We'd like to, we'd like to settle here. And Moses said, no, not again. Not again. What are you doing? Your, your parents died in the wilderness because of it. And they said, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, no, sir. No, sir. 
We're going to go over and help conquer the territory. We're going to leave our families here. We're going to trust God. Because God said you could. To take care of our families on this side. We're going to go and fight with our brothers for however many years that takes. But then we're saying, can we then come back here? And he went, okay. And God said, that's, that's a good plan. That's good. As long as they'll go over and help their brothers. And so... Um, we're reminded that was so a huge misunderstanding against that group of people already among the people of God. They, Moses was quick to judge, and then God said, no, 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 listen to them. They're, that's not, you're misreading them. Um, and so now it was time. They had spent years fighting together, and God said, you trust me. You left your families back there in a, in a strange land. I've protected your families, and it's time now you get to go back with God's blessing, cross over the Jordan River, Go to your families on the other side. Go back with our blessing. We love you, brothers. Thank you for fighting with us in the good fight. Go back. Well, after they did this, look in, uh, I'm in verse 10 of Joshua 22. This is on page 2, line 125. And when they came to the region of the Jordan that is in the land of Canaan, in other words, on the east side, the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by the Jordan, an altar of imposing size. And the people of Israel heard it and said, uh-oh, because God had told them, once you get into the land and I tell you where to set up the altar, you build one place of sacrifice. And don't you sacrifice any place else. I don't want you getting into what these, the people of this land, they sacrifice wherever they want to. They, they, and I don't want you doing that. Um, and so the people of Israel heard it and went, Oh no, behold, the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built the altar at the frontier of the land of Canaan in the region about the Jordan on the side that belongs to the people of Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, the whole assembly of the people of Israel gathered at Shiloh to make war against them. And that was the right thing to do. I don't have time to go into it now, but on uh, page four of your study sheet, I put uh, Deuteronomy 13, which says why they were so quick to do that. God said, if your people, I don't care how, how much you love them, if, if one group of the people tries to mislead you in worship, away from the worship that I told you to have, do not pity them. Do not, quote unquote, show mercy on them. Show mercy on the whole group of people. You take that seriously. After you, now, here's, but here's what's important. God said, after you have thoroughly checked it out, and that's so important. That's first pure, then, then what? Then peaceable, making sure we're not jumping the gun. By the way, they had already jumped the gun with this group a few years before. Um, but they got together ready to make war against them. But thankfully, before they made war, they did the other part of Deuteronomy 13. Um, verse 13, I'm, I'm back in Joshua 22, 13 on page two of your study sheet, line 151. Then the people of Israel sent to the people of Reuben and the people of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh and the land of Gilead. Hey, who did they send? Phinehas. That's our same guy. Why? Well, he had a reputation for being eager for what? Purity. But we're going to find out that's not all. He wasn't a one-trick pony. He had this biblical balance of first pure, then what? Then peaceable. Look at this. They sent Phinehas with him ten chiefs, one from each of the tribal families of Israel, each, every one of them, the head of a family among the clans of Israel. And they came to the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, the half-tribe Manasseh, in the land of Gilead, and they said to them, Thus says the whole congregation of Yahweh. What is this breach of faith that you have committed against the God of Israel in turning away this day from following the Lord by building yourselves an altar this day in rebellion against the Lord, against Yahweh? And then they use illustration from Numbers 25 above. Don't be like, you know, when all those people died because we intermingled. So don't be like that. So they use that as an illustration. Number one illustration, verse 17. Have we not had enough of the sin at Peor from which even yet we have not cleansed ourselves? That's what we were looking at in Joshua. And from, uh, for which there came a plague upon the congregation of Yahweh, that you too must turn away this day from following Yahweh. And if you too rebel against Yahweh today, then tomorrow he will be angry, not just with them, but with who? Everybody. The whole congregation? Yeah. This is why first pure, then peaceable. If, if in order to be friends, we got to compromise purity, we can't, we can't do it. 
Um, so tomorrow, God will be angry with the whole congregation. Verse 19, but now, if the land of your possession is unclean, pass over into Yahweh's land where Yahweh's tabernacle stands and take for yourselves a possession among us. Only do not rebel. So I want you to catch what they're saying. We know it'll be a lot tighter for us if all of y'all come over on this side where the altar is, but we're willing for that. If you're going to do false worship because you're over on this side of the Jordan, come on over and we'll be tight together. That's all right. We don't want to have to kill you, which we're ready to do. But we're not going to compromise purity either. So we're, we're very willing to be very inconvenienced because we want first pure, then peaceable. And don't miss that. We're, we're ready for you to come over and take up our land if we can be pure and peaceable. So if this side is just too, if you've decided it's too defiled, we've got to have our own altar over here. Don't do that. Don't do that. Um, so they're pleading with them. And then they use another illustration, which we don't even have time to go into, about Achan. Remember, he was the one, one guy stole a few things. And God allowed quite a few of their men to die. And when they said, what's going on? God said, there's sin among you and you need to, you need to ferret it out. Um, so, uh, verse 21. Then the people of Reuben, the people of Gad, the half-tribe of Manasseh, that's the ones on the eastern side of uh, the Jordan, said in answer to the heads of the families of Israel, the mighty one, God, Yahweh, the mighty one, God, Yahweh, he knows and let Israel itself know if it was in rebellion or in breach of faith against Yahweh, do not spare us today. I love that. That's part of how you know if somebody's in the right. Hey, if we're in the wrong, we don't want to be spared. But that's not what it is. Listen, listen all the way through it. But uh, do not spare us today if we, are, if we are in rebellion for building an altar to turn away from following Yahweh. If that's what we're trying to do, don't spare us. Or if we did so to offer burnt offerings or grain offerings or peace on, offerings on it, may Yahweh himself take vengeance. By the way, here's what they didn't say. They didn't say, I can't believe you all are so quick to judge us again. This is just like what happened several years ago. We've already seen this happen. What is wrong with you jokers? Why can't you, you know, kind of trust that, you know, um, they didn't do that. They were easily entreated, by the way, and the other side was easily entreated. This is, this is a beautiful thing. This is how it's supposed to be. We want you to be pure, brothers. Thank you for wanting to be pure. But listen, you don't have the whole story yet. And so, um, so why did they do it? So we didn't do it to uh, sacrifice here. Let me summarize. They said we did it so that our kids wouldn't think because of this big barrier of the Jordan River that we're not really a part of them. We have this altar erected not to ever sacrifice on it, but as a memorial to the altar that we're going to cross the Jordan several times a year, just like God said, to go over. We want our kids to remember we're part of them. We're not, in our, we're not doing our own thing. And when Phinehas and the men heard that, they didn't say, well, we're all spun up for battle, and so that's not good enough. What, here's what they did. They rejoiced and they said, Praise be to God, and they, they celebrated together. There's peace. There's first purity, and then there's also peace. That's, that's, the, that's the beautiful thing. And by the way, it was because they were willing to be entreated, both sides. So the people on the east side didn't bow up and say, how could you do this again? Misunderstand us. But the people from the west side weren't so quick to wipe them out that they didn't listen to the whole story. Um, on this whole easily entreated, I put two proverbs in here on page three. Jump, jump down there to uh, these two proverbs. Proverbs 18.13 says, He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. I'm convinced one of the things social media, one of the awful things social media has made us worse about is just hearing something and, and reacting quickly. Well, I've heard all I need to hear. Ba, 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 ba. The Bible says that's a foolish person. You need to make sure you've heard the whole thing. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. And, and by the way, from Proverbs 18, 17, by the way, which by no 
coincidence is just four verses later. God says, and here's what it means to hear it. It means to hear both sides. It means to hear the whole thing. The one who states his case first, what? Seems right until the other comes and examines him. Was most of Israel pretty sure they had heard enough and pretty sure we're going to have to wipe out? They were pretty sure. I mean, they, they got together for war. But then when they sent some trusted, wise people who were ready to fight, they had proved it. We're ready to do what we got to do for purity. But we're also ready to be easily entreated. We want to hear, we want to make sure, we want to check it out first and make sure this is right. When they heard the other side, they went, oh, praise the Lord. Uh, there can be reconciliation. And that's got to always be the goal. Folks, we've got to remember that. Uh, um, there's something wrong when people who say, I'm all about the purity, seem really happy to separate from people. God made us for fellowship. It ought to always be heartbreaking for us to have to split off from somebody. I've seen street preachers preaching, you're all going to hell, and they seemed awfully happy about it. That's awful. We need to be clear. Anybody that doesn't turn from their sin and turn to Jesus is going to hell, and I don't want you to go there. And God doesn't want you to go there so much he sent his only begotten son. Turn to him and be saved. Come to life. Don't go, don't go to hell. We need to say that with tears. When somebody is unrepentant we don't we don't say well good now I don't have to have anything to do with you we just say this breaks my heart but I can't have anything to do with you after by the way we've taken multiple steps we've taken others with us because maybe we've missed something and then we go to the church and the church appeals to them and we we take all those steps if they still then we say first pure then peaceable but let's Let's aim for that biblical balance. In all the controversies in our day, let's say, Lord, help us be first pure, but then peaceful and gentle, easily entreated, full of mercy and good fruits. And then it talks about the harvest of righteousness sown in peace by those who make peace. Let's pray. Lord, we want to see this in your church, in our families, in the nation. We know we can't be at peace with all. But Lord, may that always be a heartbreak to us. May we, yes, be first pure. Oh, and, and may we check ourselves. All of us probably learn, lean more towards I'm all about purity or I'm all about what we call peace. And we need to be first pure, then peaceable. We need that biblical balance, that biblical balance there. Lord, may we have that. That's, that is not natural. This is the wisdom that is from above. This only comes from your spirit. Lord, um, may we make sure that our church leaders are growing in this and praying for them to grow in this. But may we all, may we all be growing in this. Um, this is what, this is a beautiful thing, seeing how your people work together in the life of Phinehas. Lord, help us to grow in being first pure than peaceable. For your glory, in Jesus' name.